Hello and welcome to another episode of uh, uh, 81 All Out Podcast. I'm Siddhartha Vaidyanathan, Sidvi on Twitter. And uh, I'm joined today by um, some special guests. There's uh, Kartikeya Date, who tweets at Cricketing View, and he contributes essays on cricket to ESPN, Crickinfo, and other publications. And there's Daniel Norcross from London, who is a BBC Test Match Special commentator, and he also says, lazy writer. Uh, the other person on the call is uh, Ashoka, uh, who is AB Van on Twitter, and uh, he's uh, one of the core uh, team members of 81 All Out. So today we're going to talk about uh, an interesting topic, which is how uh, one watches the game and what one takes into account while watching the game. I know this sounds like a very broad topic, but we'll try and narrow it down as we go along. Um, the idea came from Karthikeya, and I think it's an interesting one about how at different stages we watch the game in different ways. When we are kids, uh, there are certain things that catch our eye and we have certain uh, things that really upset us when we grow up and uh, uh, we, we look at it in a slightly different way. Maybe things that used to bother us before don't bother us uh, anymore. And then we have new things to outrage about. And of course, these days, unlike uh, earlier, in the last, over the last uh, decade, we have uh, different ways in which we can watch the game. We can watch it on, uh, uh, we can watch it on the television and then uh, tweet about it or write posts on Facebook. We can watch it. We can listen to it on the radio. Let me uh, st- talk a bit about myself. I mean, when I was a, a kid, the only thing that really used to, uh, you know, bother me while watching the game was um, <laughs> whether whether the team, the how well the teams did. Whether the, in, I mean, I used to follow a lot of Indian cricket, so I used to feel very bad when India lost, which was very often uh, in the late eighties and nineties. And I used to feel good when India won. I mean, not, the, the little things that went into it, like uh, uh, particular commentators, uh, didn't uh, really irritate me as much. I mean, a lot of commentary irritates me now, but commentary really didn't irritate me. I used to remember a lot of lines from commentary. And then as I moved along, I, I became a full-time journalist with ESPN Quick Info. And that brought a completely new perspective to the game. I, I started watching... Uh, with uh, uh, the sole purpose of what I'm going to write for the day, how I'm going to shape the narrative, what uh, what are the key themes that I'm going to follow. So that was a completely different change. It, and now, of course, I don't work full-time on in cricket, but I do write cricketing columns and I write freelance uh, articles. And this brings in a sort of a mixture of a fan as well as a journalist. I, I do want, uh, I do occasionally wish that the team does well. I was very, very happy when India won in Australia recently but i'm also looking out for broader themes that i can explore in my pieces and so the things that uh, a lot more things bother me now because they they uh, i need to keep an eye on uh, things like uh, over rates and uh, player behavior and uh, commentary because i feel that if if i keep an eye on them i can write on them so that's how it's changed for me so i'd like to bring in uh, our guest now So Kartikeya, let's. Uh, this this was your idea, of course. So tell us a bit about how uh, things have changed, and then we can get into specifics of uh, uh, how everything different now. Well, I, I mean, it it was it was interesting to listen to your sort of trajectory going from a from a from a you know schoolboy to now. Uh, I mean, I I had, I have had similar experience. I have never been a full time journalist. but uh i've started watching because my father used to watch basically and uh uh i started sort of i learned how to watch from him basically because he used to watch and he really understood he used to play when he was in school and so from there that that sort of shaped how i sort of learned to watch you know and uh, you know things like commentary and all this never really bothered me because in my house i the my 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 sort of enduring memory of watching cricket is to watch it on mute you know uh, in my house because uh, you know someone else used to be doing something and you know me and my father used to watch with with the, with the volume switched off you know because we didn't really need it because my father would explain to me what was going if i can point point to one big change is in 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 how i have come to see cricket uh, over the years is that my i've changed sort of how i think of 
cricketers you know there was before they used to be like these idols gods you know i used to have their pictures on my on 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 my on my room uh, my door i used to stick pictures i used to cut them out from sports star and stick them on my door and uh, they, now they're sort of not they 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 no long i don't no longer think of them as like well rounded human beings and i think that's sort of a altogether healthy thing now but i no longer think of them as idols i no longer think of them as like you know responsible adults or you know moral beings or anything like that they're just players you know and it and you, the, the thinking of them as competitors and players narrowly is a is i think a, a the biggest change that that i've sort of experienced very interesting so daniel are cricketers people to you or are they just players <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, so much what Carter Kay said chimed with me. A very similar background. I used to watch it with my father when I was very young, when I was about seven. And I started watching in the 1970s, but 1975 was the first series I remember when I was about six years old. And listening to everything that he said, there are so many similarities. A lot of those have to do with a child's mind, aren't they? Um, to me, individual players were were the things that I was... fixated by so i guess you know the the sort of entertainment element was contained within the fascination with individual players and the first ones that as an englishman you got into were the ones who were cussed and were kind of anti cricket the likes of uh, david steele and jeffrey boycott and john edrich because they would defy um the superior athleticism and brilliance of of our opponents and so you know doesn't matter how fast you are and how good you are at the game we've got somebody so monumentally destructive and boring that we can ruin it for you and that would create great pleasure for me so i was i was able to endure what what is now considered to be boring um every dot ball was just delicious to me the longer they defied and then i'd contrast that with gower and botham so you know my i i sort of swung between um adoration of two completely opposite ways of playing the game uh, but i would say though that i mean this is got to go i'd say that there are actually sort of four distinct ways in which i watched cricket one is at the ground so the first time i watched it in 1976 at the oval and then it was all about the the wide picture just just really understanding how incredibly difficult it is to play cricket at the top level because when you watch on the tv you know you're looking straight down the line and the ball looks looks slower doesn't it and and actually yeah. it it you looks like you know what you what to do mm-hmm. and then when you're there and you see the ball pinging off of Richard's bat off you know Mike Selvey and flying into the stands and and going 100 yards across a scorched baked earth you think bloody hell this is really horribly difficult so there's that so there's that part of watching and you're also watching the tactical maneuvers of captains and suddenly the game becomes more complex there's the tv watching which is a kind of simplistic watch when you're at home and you project what you want to have happen i think on yourself because you you know you're sat on your sofa and you think well if i'm going to be sat on my sofa and uh, got my drinks lined up and I got my packet of fags what do I want to see today you know I want Jos Butler to entertain me by getting 100 so please people get out get him in and then I can get to the meat of what I want to do and then you've got watching through the radio which i guess for for a lot of people around the world is not quite as profound an experience as it is for people in England because test match specialist has been around for over 60 years and and it was how we used to um consume most of our cricket it, frankly because when you're at school you can't watch the game so you take in a transistor radio and you're sort of listening furtively while doing double latin um and you're sort of hearing the game but you're you're visualizing it through the language um and that's why I I was very amused when you talk about how your commentators irritating you because commentators have been the way in which I've seen cricket I guess because of listening to so much radio going on long car journeys being abroad you know always trying to convince your mother that we go to northern france why northern france well because it was actually the furthest south that you could pick up the radio frequency <laughs> in order to be able to hear what was going on you know otherwise 
you literally had to wait two days for the English newspapers to arrive in, in Malta or the south of France to find out what had happened. I know we'll come on to that later, but, you know, that, that sort of horrible sense of distance meant that you were watching it and barely watching it at all. And then I guess the, the fourth distinct way is watching it when you're playing it. When I thought about this, I spent a lot of my late youth and 20s and early 30s captaining teams and then you watch cricket completely differently. You watch the the batsmen. You're fixated by you know where their hands are on the bat, where they push the ball most frequently. So you're thinking only in terms not about the bigger picture of the game, actually about just that moment and watching that moment forensically, trying to think where can I tell my bowler to bowl, where shall I put my field, and the game itself then becomes a whole. Si- series of individual moments and you're watching and thinking only about those moments and they're, they're very very different ways to consume the game I guess um, I've now ended up in I'm now going to make a fifth version I'm afraid which is I've now ended up watching it and commentating it and you're so used to when you're younger watching the game sort of in silence now I've got to actually say what's going on and now you know I barely see the game because when you commentator game especially audio commentary less tv but audio commentary you have to describe everything so i have to describe the field i have to describe where the ball's pitched where it's been hit what the score is now and for each 20 minute segment that i'm on commentary i don't remember really anything about what i've seen because i have to constantly be describing the bits of the days that i see when i'm working are actually the bits when i'm off commentary and I can sit quietly in the room next door and gaze at it and see what's actually happening. So I can then come on and ask the person to my right what he thinks is going on, vaguely listen to his answer before trying to get him to shut up before the bowler bowls and then go through the whole long-winded explanation. Because on radio, you know, you can't, you can't just sit there and go, oh, that's four. <laughs> you have to say he's up to the wicket, he bowls, he's played it off the front foot, driven it through extra cover and it's run into the boundary sponge and the score has moved on too. So in a strange kind of way, you're not really seeing anything at all. You're kind of a cipher. Um, you're kind of a, a, a human camera. Um, so it, it's only the bits when you're not commentating that you really understand what's going on, which may be the source of your frustration with commentators, actually. Well, my source of frustration, I think, stems from the fact that I had such, uh, that commentators have had such a huge uh, influence on me while growing up watching. I feel that uh, the, the current commentators uh, perhaps aren't doing as good a job as the commentators that uh, I had when I was growing up. And this is, I feel that the current generation of kids who are learning cricket and falling in love with cricket are getting a raw deal. But that's probably just me growing old. But the one, one moment, that, that, like the only one time when I get really, really frustrated is that when something big happens when something grand happens it's probably the uh, you know it's going to happen once in every 20 years and then you have a commentator on air who is not really doing justice to that that's when it really gets my goat because i know as a child children remember lines children remember great moments through great commentary and when a commentator doesn't really uh, match up to the moment i feel very bad can i can i add uh, because uh, I think your frustration uh, and adding to Daniel's point, there is also a sixth way of consuming cricket today, okay. which is via apps and, and Twitter itself. It's a virtual stadium that we construct with our laptops and our phones. And, and the way today Hotstar is streaming services, uh, you, you get a chat window right below the screen of your phone and you get to predict what happens next ball. I mean, what... I mean, the, the way cricket is being consumed by people today on phones is, is, would be considered mad in the 90s when we used to watch cricket. I mean, uh, it, it is insane. And therefore, and it also speaks to the volumes and, and the moment definition that you talk about. When you say that there is an important moment that might be a definitive moment in cricket and, and also as a cricket watching experience, the volume of cricket that people watch these days, and I also question the duration of cricket that people watch these days. Uh, I mean, how do you make context 
of all those i mean but right today there may be people chatting and fighting about what india should have bowled what siddharth kohl should have done in the last two overs and parallelly there must be a discussion about how josh butler is mauling the west indies bowlers i mean where is the definitive moment for a for a cricket fan who's 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 in the internet these days in england there has always been an expectation of test match special being actually more than a cricket program because quite a large amount of our listenership is not actually expert in cricket it's it's a lot of people yeah. who just happen to be at home and they want familiar voices and it's actually the sort of there's a kind of operatic quality almost homeric quality as well because they like mm-hmm. to hear repetition and they like to hear the two slips of gully cover point extra mid off mid wicket square leg and a long leg as he comes into bowl and this kind of very comforting burble in the background is part of our uh, our armory and it's what what's expected of us so what we tend to do on radio is far less go into things like pitch maps but from anything else because it's on radio those visual aids are more difficult to describe there's the specificity of description is hard where the ball actually goes how much it actually swings how much it actually turns you can't get to see and although we have monitors the commentator doesn't get to do that the, because the commentator has to follow the ball because also on the radio and i i think this is a more peculiarly english thing because in australia the, the radio commentary tends to be a little bit straighter we're encouraged to dabble in frivolity um because it's a long day seven and a half hours and people want a variety you know so not everything is absolutely straight up and down like it is on say maybe abc or whatever um that means that we tend not to get bogged down in technical aspects quite so much of, of exactly you know where that where where he's constantly pitching the ball whether this guy has an average of 27 against leg spin etc cetera, etc cetera. On the TV, because it's sort of straighter and because they really have, they've got so many gizmos, they kind of feel they need to use them. It's like a nuclear arms race between TV companies to prove that they've got better and better analytic tools. So they can rather, I, for me, they can turn cricket into quite a Spartan exercise as if everything is purely functional. One of the things I've, I've realized over the years is that it's sort of especially with test cricket you know there are some things in the game which are much easy much more easily observed than other things you know like you know for for instance i think generally i think batting is easier to observe than bowling because sort of the batting episode takes place you know firstly you are always it, it always takes place in front of you you know nowadays the bowler is never running up to you you know the bowl, your bowler is always running away from you you know uh, i mean i remember i i won i once played hooky from college and went to watch uh, bombay play australia in 2001 that was their tour match uh, and uh, uh, that in that game I, i think all of them played magra played and everybody played and i i, I, rem- I still remember every ball magra bowled that morning uh to the to the bombay batsmen at cci and that time it was not very crowded because it was a tour game and you could still sit bang behind the bowler's arm and you could observe everything really well you know and there wasn't any there weren't like a thousand people around you making a lot of noise so you know it was very it was very nice to watch and it, and and he bowled for like an hour and it was it was it was, it was amazing to watch and then i've also watched a test match and at that time i was not sitting behind the bowlers arm i was sitting like maybe like uh, you know wide mid on something like that and it was a really really frustrating day of watching because you could not watch any actual cricket that way mm. you know it's just it's impossible to follow cricket unless you're watching it from behind the bowlers arm you know uh, you can only watch like some sort of stray things you know which which are which are available to you from that vantage point you know uh, and well, then you, you experience it got okay that that's what i was it's a different thing altogether isn't it i mean what you're doing yeah, there yeah it is yeah you're sort of you're I, experiencing it as opposed to understanding it i guess yeah i mean but but i but I, as you watch for many years then you sort of grow out of that experience you know you sort of 
So you're like, yeah, okay, fine. You know, mm. I, I want to see why it is that some players succeed better than others. You know, why it is that some comp- some comp- competition and some contest ends up the way it does. You know, is there an order to that? You know, and this may be sort of my professional training speaking. You know, in my real life, I, I'm academic, so. That, perhaps that's one of the reasons why I think this way. But I, I and, find and, myself wondering and about also, And it's also less of a distraction, right? I mean, when you watch it in a stadium, uh, I mean, you, you are invariably, you are gaining the experience, but at certain points in time, the, the passage of play is so intense that you do not want to be switched off. And it is impossible to do that in a stadium. I mean, with people around, people moving uh, this yeah. way and that way, you do miss a very crucial point and then you're looking around the screens saying, can I catch the replay? But yeah. in TV, uh, yeah. invariably that doesn't happen. I mean, yeah. and it is it is good for an intense period of play, the TV watching. I mean, today with mobile phones, you can do that on the go as well. I mean, I watched it while traveling in a cab uh, with headphones on and then that's it. You're, you're glued on to it. I was yeah, li- listening recently to... Uh, a- the Sky podcast with uh, Nasser Hussain and um, Michael Atherton and the team. And there, uh, there was a, they were discussing the lack of crowds in the test matches in West Indies. I mean, the, mostly, the crowds were mostly uh, English tourists and there were hardly any locals in there. And Nasser Hussain was saying, and this is a point I strongly disagree with, but Nasser Hussain was saying how uh, the cricket authorities should realize that um, uh, the... Uh, Watching a match at home on television is far more uh, comfortable and friendly, uh, viewer friendly than watching on the stadium. And he was suggesting that uh, authorities try and create the experience of uh, what you get, create the home experience when you're in the stadium. And he suggested that that would bring more people in. But for me, I strongly disagree with that because I think the st- in-stadium experience is so unique and so different. And as you say, it can be so unique for somebody sitting at mid-wicket and somebody sitting, at, uh, sitting behind the bowler's arm that they should actually be going the other way. They should actually be differentiating it so much from the in-home experience that people are then drawn towards catching that new way of watching the game and, and so that they find time to actually go and watch these games. I think you have to sort of, as a viewer or as an observer, you have to also be equipped to to observe, no? I mean, I, I'll, I'll give you like well, two examples, right? Uh, both of us come from watching with my father, you know, and, uh, you know, Indian batsmen look like a million dollars in India and then they go to England and, you know, they they play in Mace and they edge and everything for, for a long time. And then there's a lot of this complex conversation about footwork and this and that and balance and blah. And and I never really understood what any of that meant for a really long time. And then once I, I, my father sort of just observed in an offhand way that, you know, he's meeting the ball too far in front of his pad, you know. And, and that... That was when I understood what it means to sort of why that late movement really matters. You know, that, 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 that sort of, that insight sort of changes the eyes with which you see the game, you know, and then sort of all sorts of other sort of insights become available to you. This was another thing which my father pointed out to me. And then I still remember he said, well, I, I was watching and Harbhajan Singh, you know, there was a time when he was not getting any wickets, you know, and uh, he was bowling a lot. And, uh, and, my, my, and I was watching with my father once. He said, well, he's not hitting the bat high anymore. Yeah. Now, that was another thing where I understood like, all right, well, that's what dip means. Well, because when the ball dips and the player batsman is playing it, the ball ends up hitting the bat high near the handle quite often. You know, yeah, and now I sort of look for that. You know, so th- this is what this is what I mean by this. There's so much in the game itself to watch that you know it, it increasingly seems to me that all this other stuff, you know, this extraneous stuff about you know personality, morality, all these things are sort of just you know 
surplus to requirements. You know, there's I, there's enough in the game for me to like enjoy it for whatever half an hour, forty five minutes, and I'm happy with that. Yeah, I, I agree with that completely. Uh, and, and in fairness to TV, and I'm going to go back slightly on myself, what I said earlier. But actually, the, we never got the opportunity to know where the batsman was was meeting the ball when watching on TV 30 years ago. Now, yeah. you can see very specifically, like during the, the England-India series, where Kohli was hitting the ball yeah. and where Rahane was hitting the ball were yeah. initially two completely different places. And after Kohli's first innings, watching how the Indian batsman had modified their approach in line with Kohli for the latter uh, games in the series was fascinating, I thought. And you saw that very graphically illustrated on TV. Somebody recently suggested on Twitter and uh, uh, that the television uh, companies, the television feed uh, can easily have a corner, a, a small box in the corner mm. that shows the field for every ball. and that I've, will... been, I've been big on that. It's, it drives me mad because it's so obvious thing to do, isn't it? Exactly. And it's not the whole field is not in the picture all the time. You know, exactly, the infield might be if you're lucky. Wasn't it there during the uh, Australian uh, Channel Nine coverage? I mean, it it not... has been. It, ha- it has uh-huh. been, and that's what and that's what irritates me because they can find space to put in a logo for for something. You know, they can put in the channel's logo, or they can give you the score bar and make it go all the way across the bottom. But actually, just in the bottom right hand corner. Show me where the fielders are, because without that, my watching experience is massively depleted. Because I don't really know, you know. I've had to do commentary off the telly, and it's the hardest thing when you don't know where long on and long off are or deep mid wicket. Because there's a ball slapped out there, you don't know whether that was a smart shot by the batsman going over the infield to a space where there's nobody, or whether he's actually played straight into the hands of the bowler. You know, there used to be a game called. Uh... EA cricket, or uh, it, it was the last, I think, of 2008, where the inset pitcher with the field placing was there all the time. And it made a huge sense because when you're batting in that game, when you're a batsman in that game, you just see the bowler coming, I mean, uh, uh, at you. And you, don't, you do not know whether the, uh, lo- if there is a long on or, or if, if it has been pushed up, if the third man is back. So you do not know. Without that picture, you cannot decide on your next shot whether to hit it up in the air or just to nudge it out. It it's makes not, so much sense in a game. So I think it should have been there in cricket watching as well. I think the person who uh, suggested that on Twitter mentioned EA Cricket too. I forget the Twitter handle that mentioned it. So if you're listening, I'm a, <laughs> apologies. But yeah, they did mention EA Cricket and how they could, how television could borrow from that. Because it's not a technical sort of hurdle that they have to cross. They already know how to do it. It's just a. I. I, I mean, I, I keep it, wondering why they don't do it. You know, maybe there's just not demand for them to do it. And in fact, if they do it, there would even be uh, that would lead to uh, a further extension in the way we understand cricket, because cricket is so primitive when it comes to fielding records and fielding stats that yeah. uh, we, we have absolutely no idea how what the field was when uh, Kohli got out uh, in a certain game. I mean, uh, if I have to go back to the ball-by-ball commentary, if the commentator was good enough to provide some insight about the field changing, fair enough. But 99% of the time, he's probably yeah. not going to know himself. And so, we have our understanding of cricket is so diminished because fielding is so far behind in terms of uh, recording. And in, the scorecard doesn't record it. Statisticians don't really know. Uh, I mean, somebody makes a blanket statements like uh, India's slip cordon has drastically, uh, you know, it's dra- is much worse than it was five years ago. But how do you know? What is the? How can you substantiate yeah. that fact? You know, I mean, uh, Daniel, I have a question. Uh, I mean, to you specifically, because what do you? Th- I mean, when you do commentary for TV, though, you are obliged to comment on the replays as well. Right. I mean, we more often than not, we do see people commenting on the replays on how good a shot that is or how great a ball that is. So does that and after the commentary and after the event or let's say between overs, you cut to commercials. So do you find the descriptive space or the space where you give the audience a kind of a feel for the field? That that window narrows down and down because now you're describing the replays, you're describing the ball, you're describing match situation. And there are commercials in between as well. Do, do yeah, you think that restricts you? 
Yeah, massively. I mean, as as a in terms of what you can achieve on commentary on TV, you are quite heavily limited. You're also limited by certain totally understandable practical requirements. So, as a bowler comes in, you've got to be silent because you've got to allow the space for the shot to happen because it's going to be used in highlights. So, if you're in the middle of a discussion about field placings. Um, if it's come out of context, if there'd been a series of dot balls before, for example, they're not they're not going to want to cut them into the highlights at the end of the day's play. So you have to be mindful of each event, potentially containing a wicket, containing a four or a six or a drop catch or something. So each of those has to be sliceable and editable out into a package that makes sense. They don't want to hear the commentator say, and that's why he's got two slips in. <laughs> you know, just as the bowler comes in and then it's hit for four, you know, because it's then the the, the listener afterwards thinking, what's he talking about? Because yeah, I didn't hear the rest of the conversation. So in terms of more wide-ranging discussion, it's a little bit more tricky. In one-day games, you are given space to talk about uh, fields because of the anticipation of what you think a bowler's trying to achieve. So you do that in between the balls, really, and that you'll try to direct by um, by saying that you'll try you'll effectively be directing the cameras to go in search of these field placings because you're trying to help out the watcher in in live time because they're listening the the director's listening to you and then um, sends the the, the cameraman off in search of validating images if you see what I mean. But broadly speaking, um, you have a greater opportunity on radio to get more deeply into the situation that you're in right now because we're not really worrying about highlights reels because radio is taking place in real time. TV is is essentially always worried about the one-hour package they're going to put out at the end of the day. So that inhibits, to a degree, the way you can talk about the game. Let me bring in um, uh, something that I want to talk about. Let me first get Daniel into it. How how, uh, conscious are you of the words uh, that you use, uh, is it often instinctive? Is, is are there sometimes there are some things and words and phrases that you strictly avoid? Uh, I know that cricket often tends to go into um, a militaristic jargon like, uh, yes. like you know, decimate and destroy and annihilate and things, which have been part of cricket's lexicon. But how cautious are you about words and uh, terms that have? Uh, often become cliches. I mean, some commentators are known for their cliches, but how, yeah. how, I want to get your view on that. Well, th- there's a couple of things to unpick there. Uh, yes, I, I, you'd, you ought to be and should be very concerned about cliches and repetition. There are certain types of repetition that are acceptable, um, like, the, like describing the field, but if you, you find yourself saying something over and over again, you, you hate yourself because you hear yourself back and you, you, you've used the same terminology um, in terms of, you know, let's just cover off the first bit, which is when you can get attacked on social media. I'll give you an example. You can get so relaxed behind the microphone, forget that there's anyone else there. That's partly what makes you any good at it, really, is becoming totally unselfconscious. That I'm, I, I remember describing Nathan Lyon as a man who looks like he hangs around a bus shelter asking for change. <laughs> <laughs> because, because he has a certain look, you know. But then... Within no time, because I'm doing this on the BBC, I'm being accused of being uh, disrespectful of the homeless. Now, of course, you know, you're not trying to be disrespectful of the homeless. It's the last thing you want to be. But actually, when you hear somebody say that you are, you think, well, yeah, may- maybe I was. May- maybe I was saying something that makes me laugh. But that's not really what the purpose of what I'm there to do is. As for cliches, there are some commentators that really don't mind, uh, and it's kind of encouraged almost. You know, things like one big over. Um, I mean, that's one that really drives me mad because <laughs> yeah. um, it's six balls. To me, a, a 50 over game contains 300 balls, and a 20 over game contains 120 balls. And the very best teams are the ones that see 300 events and 120 events, and they play to that. They don't actually go, right, you know, I've got four off this over. That therefore means there's less pressure on me for the rest of the over to get X number of runs. We're still sort of used to old terminology, things like building a platform. Um, I understand where this comes from, 
But the game's moved on. I mean, there was a time when teams actually did build platforms and they thought that if there were 100 for none off 25 overs, that was a good thing. I mean, 100 for none off 25 overs now is a pretty disastrous start uh, just because you've got 10 wickets in hand. I mean, if you get two new bats at the crease, I mean, this is the thing. I mean, commentators will argue against themselves. They'll say, they've got wickets in hand. This means they're in a great position to push on. And then they'll say, next minute, well, if you get two new batsmen at the crease, this going to be really hard. Go, well, exactly. <laughs> Which is why the, these kind of cliches uh, drive me mad. Because the, the biggest, biggest error for any commentator is to sound bored by what they do. Because we've got the luckiest, we're the luckiest people in the world. We've got the best job imaginable. We're paid to watch cricket and we're allowed our opinions on them. But the problem there becomes not the synonyms that one can find. It It is logically incorrect statements that creep into your vocabulary. Like whenever a tail end partnership is going on, we hear things like every run is a gold dust. <laughs> or, or, or yeah. I mean, when isn't a run important? I mean, <laughs> uh, I, I, I agree. I think- what they're, what they're trying to say is every run is surprising because, you know, it's, it's like my, my, my least favourite one is the one you get in football when they say ironic applause. <laughs> and it isn't ironic applause, it's sarcastic <laughs> applause, <laughs> which is very, very different. It's not remotely ironic. Yeah, I mean, these are, uh, I mean, whenever I hear that kind of thing and uh, things like gritty innings, like... <laughs> I was going to bring Karthike in exactly this point. <laughs> what is a gritty innings? <laughs> Are it all innings gritty by the nature of just standing there and facing the bowler at 140 kilometers per hour? <laughs> no, I, I can imagine. I can imagine sort of a, an actual gritty innings, you know, where, you know, where the batsman is like clearly overmatched, you know, like clearly the batsman doesn't have a lot of strokes right you know like he can't hook you know he can't pull and he he's not very good like off the back foot and there are all these you know huge fast bowlers uh bowling at him for like two hours and two hours later he's still there you know so when the batsman like when there's no sort of good reason as to why he should have survived for that long and he has survived without conceding like any obvious chance yeah, that okay, fine. I can see that being called gritty. You know. Are you describing but, anything that Suresh Rainer has never quite managed to play? <laughs> I, 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 would you would you classify uh, number eleven Vishwa Fernando hanging on for those uh, six runs with uh, Kusal uh, Pereira in that famous game as a gritty innings? I would I would describe it as a lucky innings. I mean, <laughs> I know, it just happened. I mean, it, it, it's not like he knew a lot about a lot of those balls, you know. <laughs> well, I, I, mean, I, I would I would though describe it because I know you hate this kind of terminology, cards, but I would describe it as brave for the reason that, that what you're trying to do is create the distinction between a batsman like Phil Tufnell. I love him to bits, lovely man, but he would have run away to square leg off every single one of those balls. And bless him, Fernando actually stood in line with the ball. Now, you know, the fact that he got lucky <laughs> is one thing, but he did at least stand there and yeah. he could have been hit. And so right. what you're trying to do by using a word which is, has got a sort of moral implication to it, which is which I yeah. wouldn't like. It's almost sort of an Aristotelian phrase, yeah. isn't it, Br- word, brave, when I'm right. not trying to impute some kind of moral um, equality to the batsman but what I'm trying would be trying to do there is to describe that he's back he's staying in line with the ball whereas other number 11s would run away from the ball basically it's a it's a contest and it's a competition and if if it if the word applies to the competition then fine but it has to actually apply you know i mean for example if mohammad shami the way he has been playing recently batting uh, yeah. scores a half century uh, that's almost certainly an accident you know <laughs> I yeah, think, yeah. I agree. <laughs> yeah I think I think the problem comes when uh, you mean, have these terms applied to say a Virat Kohli against uh, England and yeah he, this is the best player in the world like I, I mean of course he's good enough to play anywhere 
you know speak about you know his batting there's so much to see there you know actually there's 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 so many interesting things to see in his in his game you know and there are so many things the endless things to see in tendulkar's game for example you know and uh, tendulkar's bat watching tendulkar bat is uh, one of my favorite things in the last 20 years you know, because there's just endless things which happen you know, was the the idea and i don't know if, if daniel agrees with this but i think the idea that you know you know what a player can do and you know that the player is not doing it and wondering why the player is not doing it is one of the great pleasures of watching a test match that was why you know coley in england this summer was fascinating because there was obviously there was no reason that we could what well, there was there were reasons i guess that's the point there were reasons why coley had not prevailed in english conditions before and watching how he modified his game meant that we, what we were looking at was a player like steve smith who also modified his game yeah and then you understand the level and degree of their batsmanship so they weren't just doing the same thing over and over again they were playing the game in a slightly different way uh, adjusting to conditions setting themselves up differently playing the ball later leaving certain balls it's why we all got really excited didn't we when steve war put away the hook things like that that kind of sense of self denial all those kind of things are what what is genuinely fascinating about batsmanship um what isn't fascinating about batsmanship is is as you say the sort of bold statement he can't do it in english conditions based on having looked at the numbers that he got the last time i mean that doesn't actually yeah. progress us anywhere does it in india we see that phenomenon a lot right because why is he wasting so much balls so he is not wasting anything i mean there is a bowler who's has a specific field and is bowling to that field and it is very very tough for a batsman to score runs i mean his scoring runs in test cricket or odis or t20s in itself is is a tough thing just because some people hit 26s in a game the expectation now becomes and why why doesn't this chap come around and hit 10 of his own it doesn't work like that right so i do agree with daniel when you say that uh, there has to be a context to understand the game in itself right other than that i mean we are just watching the problem is we watch the full 3 hours of a match like a highlight package right yeah, and, yeah. and and there is a, there is a question in itself do we watch the 3 hours i mean there are now people coming and saying i don't watch a full t20 now t20s have become longer <laughs> for us yeah. and and that is the that is the times that we live in well so, uh, the, the ecb has the solution for that they have the yes it's it. <laughs> <laughs> well which i which actually uh, i wanted to bring up this point i mean kartikeya wrote a, a fabulous essay uh, last year for ESPN click info about the whole myth of the finisher in uh, one day cricket and in in cricket uh, and in that w- one of the things of the essay was the last bit of the essay which i found extremely uh, interesting was how he said uh, cricket is a very very hard game to understand and which then leads us to a sort of uh, tug at clichés like finisher a match winner uh, uh, the, uh, you, you often hear commentators say they won the big moments and mm. uh, is it is it all because uh, it, it's a very difficult game at the heart of it to even explain and so it's very easy to resort to cliche i mean kartikeya can get a uh, start off and then daniel can maybe come in with his perspective well, i i don't know that it's a hard game and also about cliche you know now when daniel or let's say nasser hussain uses or, or somebody like that you know who's a professional uses it that uh, what you would call a cliche i mean they're using it knowingly you know they, they know they know what's going on and they're saying it but it it sounds like a cliche right sometimes because it's in some cases you know it then sort of travels and especially now you know commentators start having their brands and stuff and and terms travel and then other people use them not correctly like they they use them in in the wrong time in the wrong circumstances and where they don't really apply i mean you know, for instance what is th- what is winning the big moments i mean it actually that, logically doesn't make sense right no it it doesn't but you know it's true that 
there are parts of a game which appear to be big right but it there's a difference between knowing that a moment appears to be big and thinking that it is big the big moment is only really understood in retrospect once the game is over so yeah. if the big moment is that you need 45 to win in in 20 balls and you've got five wickets in hand and uh, dan christians come to the crease and then he he wins the game by hitting 33 off of 12 then he suddenly becomes two clichés he becomes the finisher who seized the big moment now yeah. <laughs> what he actually did was by force of circumstances in the match attempt to score runs uh, over two runs a ball and succeeded i mean that's essentially what what had happened just there um but the idea that we would then because we've termed him a finisher say well whichever team he's playing for won't want dan christian to have to come in before the end of the 14th over is one of the most extraordinary logical leaps that commentators make and i've never totally understood this i mean to me uh, just butler scoring 150 off 77 balls makes me wonder as it does every time he does such things what what might happen if he came in at 3 you yeah. know he might score 230 off 110 <laughs> yeah and Mind might that be, not yeah. be better for england no we need yeah. to keep him for the later overs do you i mean if if he can hit balls in the 26th over for 6 he can probably hit balls in the 16th over for 6 you know it it doesn't really make an awful lot of sense and those kind of those kind of clichés are born purely out of results it's purely out of looking retrospectively at where a batsman bats and the scores they've got and the strike rate they've got and the situations they have come in not what situations they might come in and what they might do if they were in a different situation back in the day when i was in school if you didn't watch the game and if you didn't catch the evening news uh then you had to wait for the papers the next morning to to see what happened right yeah and now you know everything that happens live and i think what that has one of the things that has done is that it has sort of increased the imperative to write to the result if you see what so so all all reporting of games is essentially a justification of the result you know it's it's a it's an explanation of the result and therefore it it leads to these sort of leaps that you talk about i think to answer to kartikeya's point i uh, Uh, writing to the result is one phenomenon and and there is a la- larger phenomenon during commentary as well and this is a very india specific comment that i'm making that you uh, you you are in, in in effect talking to the lowest common denominator and therefore when you do that there is kind of a comfort in listening to familiar words in 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 like a boundary situation i mean when a boundary is hit or in the last four overs mm. tracer bullet you mean yeah 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 tracer bullet or crunch time <laughs> or or uh, crucial <laughs> overs something's or, going to give yeah something's going to give i mean there is there is an unsaid comfort for a lay viewer i mean i am in no way condescending anybody here but there is a rhythm that has been established it may be the wrong rhythm but going to that i mean uh, riding along that rhythm kind of provides a very comforting narrative to the people who would want to tune in at say the last 10 overs of the first innings or the or the chase the last 15 overs of a chase or people who hear that hey kohli has hit three sixes let me tune in and yeah. it is a familiar comfort and and that is probably what the striving is towards the game is still the game you know and you want eventually for the game to like survive and for the game to grow you have to have more people who like the game you know and like the if if you don't understand the game you're not going to like it for very long you know you grow out of it you move on to something else you know that that's kind of fair yeah. i think you, that's very true a, yeah i i think commentators have a <laughs> have a duty to do that they they they've sort of got and touching on the on the point just made they've, they've also got the other point which is that uh we are trying to describe um the i guess the moment and in those last 10 overs 
you do know that teams are going to do what they do, uh, largely because, I mean, a lot of teams are tactically behind where they ought to be, which is not yeah. thinking about the last 10 overs, but thinking about 300 balls, you know, yeah. <laughs> but because yeah. they do think like that. I mean, a great example being, you know, Jeffrey Dujon was, was, was staggered that Shimon Hetmeyer was going hard in the 32nd over and was begging him to, to keep wickets in hand for the last 10 overs. So he was sort of still describing a, a kind of tactic that he thought was prevailing anyway within cricket. So th- yeah. there is, even if commentators may not say what you agree with, they are often reflecting the way the game is being played or is being thought about. You know, but commentators have to adjust as times change. The game is a different game now, and it's quite difficult tr- truly to understand and to recalibrate what you think is reasonable because you're trying to educate the listener as well you know into saying yeah, we, we always start at the beginning of a commentary the, the first five or six overs we try to assess the kind of pitch it is and therefore yeah. what we think a side should be striving for because a lot of teams if they strive to get 330 but it's actually a 290 pitch will end up with 220 and they've lost the game yeah. and so it's valid to to kind of look forward and think. You can never do it perfectly because it's completely inexact. I mean, it's it's crazy yeah. that we even try, you might argue, but we, we, it's incumbent upon us so to do. And similarly, it's incumbent upon us towards the last 10 overs of an innings to remind people who are relatively new to the game, well, right, guys, they've got not a lot to lose here. They've got seven wickets in hand. So the risk-reward ratio is in the favour of risk <laughs> over, yeah. over anything else because... You know, that's that's what's left. There's 60 more events. They've got seven wickets in hand. They're going to go for it. So you're kind of priming the viewer to say, don't go anywhere. Don't don't put the kettle on. Watch now. It's all going to be really great fun. As a commentator, Daniel, how how important is it to make that distinction on bring on on talking to kids who probably don't really uh, probably don't care about a lot of what we discuss and debate, but also talking to experienced uh, viewers who would want an understanding of uh, the overrate problem or the uh, lack of spectators in stadiums uh, issue? Yeah, well, it's a tricky one. With young people, you've got to, when you're commentating, you have to assume a degree of knowledge, um, I think, because I think that people, if they want to find out, will find out by asking questions. So if you just do a kind of noddy commentary, in which you're kind of assuming that everybody's coming to this for the first time, then you will alienate um, the core of your listenership, which could be seen as you know one of the arguments against the hundred, you know, it's designed to bring in people who know nothing about cricket. Whereas we all know that the way we've actually got into cricket is people who know the game better than us have taken us to it or watched it with us on television. And you, um, if you are, if you have curiosity uh, and if you're enjoying it. You ask questions and you receive the answers and you become more knowledgeable through absorbing it. Um, Which is not to say that you aren't conscious of the fact that there are new listeners coming on board. Um, You will try to describe things in in plain and simple terms, but cricket, unfortunately, has got more terms in it than uh, Surinamese language (laughs) taki-taki, which has 340 words. Uh, that's an entire language. Cricket has got, well, at least 372 separate bits of terminology that I've identified, um, are probably more than that, quite frankly. So you, I don't think you can avoid... Um, not, it's not that you assume knowledge, it's that you impart knowledge and people will, if they're interested, find out about it. One of the things I notice as well, uh, which I didn't notice as much before, perhaps because... Uh, you know, that commentary that I heard when I was growing up was totally different from now, is that the urge for commentators and writers and experts, especially with the whole immediacy thing, to pass judgment very quickly on conditions and pitches and things like that. Like on the first day of a pitch, like the second session of the first day of a test match, you'll find commentators and uh, uh, journalists who have been following the game for 30 plus years declaring that it is the worst pitch they have seen in a long time. And then the match will proceed and things will change, the pitch will change, it will wear, and then you'll have a result, probably on day four or day five. And then the, what they pronounced on day one will look really foolish. 
But it's oh, almost- this, this, this drives me mad. This drives me absolutely mad. I, I couldn't agree with you more. And it happens all the time. And that is all about immediacy. It's about yeah. not waiting and understanding and contextualizing. The UAE pitches suffer from this particular criticism, particularly badly, where a, a side will score 400 slowly in five sessions. And we've been told that this is destroying test cricket. Um, and yet invariably we'll, we'll end up in a result, quite, often quite thrillingly, uh, on the last day, because those pitches are good old-fashioned pitches, you might say, that do what they're supposed to do. Uh, they, they start off well for batsmen and then they crumble and they create incredibly exciting entertainment towards the back end of the match. Um, you will also find that, that people bring in their experience, by which I mean their past, um, really, and use that to predict exactly what's going to happen. So uh, a great example is the pitches in Sri Lanka this year. We were uh, commenting on them for a programme the BBC called the, the Cricket Social. And every expert, this wasn't just ours, it was, it was every, every expert was saying, well, these pitches can't get better. They can only get worse, as if this is absolutely definite truth. <laughs> now, I'm afraid, inevitably, they got really neither better nor worse. They just were what they were, and, and it made for rather interesting cricket with two out of three games that were very closely fought and, and reasonable finishes, you know. Um, but what's happening is that people have to frame everyone's understanding with these very broad statements that can then result in a kind of Twitter storm and fury because because Twitter is the currency of Twitter is is rage and fury and blame and judgment instantly. Uh, without that, you know, the, the cricket Twitter wouldn't really exist, would it? <laughs> because really, what we'd be saying is. Well, just hold on, have a look. Well, let, let, let's, let's decide what we think this is in a couple of days when the game has properly panned out. People say, well, that's not how Twitter works. Twitter works with me being furious now. So yeah. um, they well, will be. And then they will inevitably end up with a that tweet aged well tweet, which always <laughs> also happens. And you think, why do people never learn? I mean, not just the immediacy factor, right? Uh, not just after the first ball is bowled. Just before the ball is bowled, when a pitch report happens, I've, and I've been watching a few of these, none of them even come closer to what happens in the match, right? The, they say it's a good hard pitch, 300 par for the course, and then you see uh, the batsman kind of struggling to time the ball, and that may be due to various other things. And suddenly you have now people saying, oh, it's a spongy pitch ball kind of holds up a bit. I mean, what was the pitch report all about then? Where it becomes a problem for me is if the person who has pronounced judgment on the pitch and has said, this is a 350 pitch, then watches a team get bowled out for 230 and blames the batsman. Yeah. (laughs) Because they've assumed it's 350. They were always right it was 350. So ipso facto... If a side's got bowled out for 230, they batted badly. That doesn't, that's not always necessarily the case. So it's, it's, yeah. the, the problem lies not with the pronouncement because none of us know because it is impossible to tell. I mean, you're looking at various different types of rolled earth with various different amounts of potential grass, some live, some dead. He can't. Well, I want to. People- I want to bring um, Ashoka into this now uh, because I think this is uh, something I've been noticing uh, over the last. Uh, largely over the last uh, five to 10 years, and maybe I'm wrong, but I have a theory about this, about how uh, the pitches and the behavior of pitches, especially in test matches, and team selection about how who plays and who doesn't play has become this massive, massive issue. Like at at every game, uh, you have opinions about team selection in the beginning, in the middle, in the end. And in the end, if people are vindicated, and if the person who's picked does badly, then that's it. They're like, see, I told you so. I told you he should have never been picked. Yeah. And my theory is, and Ashoka, you can probably tell us as somebody who uh, is into this. My theory is that this rise of the fantasy leagues and fantasy cricket and this immense popularity of fantasy cricket has had a role in this. Because now everybody is a selector. Everybody feels that he can pick the team and he, he can win his fantasy league and he feels that just as he can win his fantasy league, the team should do exactly what he does. Ashoka, yeah. do you agree with me? 
Yeah, but uh, I would go the other way because uh, fantasy cricket has piggy banked on on our sensibilities of always saying that we know better than the other guy, right? So it has always been that, like all our friends are morons because we have told the right thing, and whenever something else happens, oh, that was a fluke. Oh yeah. <laughs> so, this, so this has always been how cricket has been. I mean, cricket has uh, cricket communication between friends have banter's have gone on, and fantasy to an extent has aided this. Yes, I mean, and fantasy has picky banked on this more than uh, uh, I mean, more than it should. What really happens, I mean, in in at least the daily fantasy game is, it has actually minimized the players. I mean, uh, uh, the fantasy players, not the cricket players, uh, the fantasy players. Uh, capacity for nuance because now now what had happened is out of the 22 you're going to pick 11 and and then you because of your personal failure you kind of project that onto the match as well and then you start i mean f- uh, literally frothing at the mouth i've seen people do that <laughs> <laughs> why was he picked in the first place and and there are rules where you have to pick players i mean that is another thing hold together right so when you make a fantasy team you make it before the start of the match not during the match so you you don't know the 11 in fact so when you make a team and that player is not there so it adds to the frustration <laughs> of, of of how you view the game so that is the i mean the s- small negative effect but the larger interesting effects of of playing fantasy, especially the tournament mode, is that it kind of it tortures your single team loyalty aspect into a weird thing. It 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 makes you root for players that it makes you root root for weird situations. I want player A from team A and player B from team B to do well. But what happens when player A is facing player B? <laughs> who do you want yeah, to do? I, yeah, who do you want? I mean, this is a 15 runs to get of the last over, but I don't want this guy to get out and I don't want that guy to get hit or I don't want <laughs> this guy to get out, but I want that guy to get hit because my friend has him in the team. And then now there is a game within a game or game on top of a game that's going on. And it it kind of makes cricket viewing a whole lot more weirder. <laughs> it, I mean, it does, but you know what? You know, what, what, I, what I'm hearing there is something that is pleasing me a little because the recent developments in cricket fandom, I think, have, have rendered people one-eyed to the qualities of their opponents because they start to identify with the team so much, you know. Um, and obviously, being, being English, I'm very aware of, of the uh, universal detestation of my team. <laughs> because for perfectly understandable reasons, I, by simply being an England cricket fan, have been informed by by uh, Indian fans a lot on Twitter that I am personally responsible for various massacres <laughs> in Amrits. And, um, <laughs> and you know, I mean, I, I, I don't feel that I am in, in, for many reasons. I mean, just partly which my family were were cowards and have been for generations, and so. Would never have set foot in an army suit anywhere, you know. So they never went so far as to colonise anywhere. But that's neither here nor there. I mean, my my, my point is that um, there, there has been a kind of uh, degradation in appreciation of players from other teams. And I grew up at a time when there were only six teams. So if you decided to hate everybody, then you really had to just enjoy cricket through the prism of Chris Tabaret, which is no <laughs> way to grow up as a human being, you know. Um, or Colin Dredge of Somerset. So you had you had to be able to appreciate Viv Richards and Michael Holding and Malcolm Marshall and Dennis Lilly, even though he's Australian, you know, and we're taught at birth to despise them. So a great chapel. You had to in order to be able to, because it was such a small game, you know, so you, you had to hold those players close to you. So if if fantasy leagues are going to encourage people actually to have a wider appreciation of players around the world, then I think that might 
help to reverse a trend that I don't like. And I want to bring up one point here about uh, selection and things. So what all this is, uh, I think, also leading up to, which is uh, a bit of a frustration for me, and Kartike, I want you to come in here because I know that this is a bugbear for you as well. I wrote about selection recently. Exactly. I, I read that piece in Quick Info. And one of the things that is happening, I'm noticing, oh, is uh, not only among fans, but even among journalists and among uh, commentators, is this absolute certainty with which they talk about selection and selection issues. Uh, let me give you an example. When India went to Australia recently, they uh, picked four fast bowlers in Perth, right? And they left out uh, Ravindra Jadeja, the left arm spinner. And uh, it uh, by the end of uh, i mean everyone was uh, 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 outraged about how they left out jadeja and they picked four seamers and by the end of the first day and, and as the game moved, went along it became clear that the fourth seamer that they picked who was umesh yadav was uh, not being that effective and so this whole chorus just grew and by the end of it it was almost as if india lost that match because they picked umesh yadav over ravindra jadeja now, this is a level of certainty that I'm extremely uncomfortable with because where is the doubt? Where is that benefit of doubt you give to a captain and a coach and a, a team management that has, uh, presumably knows the conditions and has a feel of the conditions far better than you do, hundreds of miles, hundreds of thousands of miles away? And where is that benefit of doubt given to the fact that perhaps Umesh had a bad game? Perhaps Jadeja could have also had a bad game. Perhaps there were... Hundred other reasons why India lost that test match. I mean, why? Why this certainty is bugging me? Does it bug you too? <laughs> well, yeah, of course it bugs me. I mean, the the but 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 I mean, I understand why it's there. I mean, I think I think one. I think Daniel that sort of touched on it earlier, and it's because of this neoliberal model that you exist in. You know that, and especially if you think that the game is a neoliberal project, like. Talking about the game is even more now. You know the meet the the sort of the media is even more about traffic, you know, because nobody pays for uh, you know articles or reading or writing or newspapers or anything anymore. You know, so the only way to make money is to have you know traffic to to produce more traffic, and so therefore, so you know, certainty creates controversy, and so therefore it's profitable. You know, this outrage is a very very profitable business model. You know, the, the, the degrees of hypocrisy that we have to go through in the media are, are truly astounding. It reminds me of a sketch, an old English program called Not the Nine O'Clock News, where two politicians are arguing very, very violently on a, on a couch. And um, one of them says, you, you are the sort of politician. And then the other guy clutches his chest and has a heart attack and dies. He says, who will be sorely missed? <laughs> 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 and, and effectively, we, we, we go through this sort of dance. Um, and, and I'm not going to criticise it too much, actually, because, yeah. you know, we're part of the entertainment industry. So if we're not being 100% accurate the whole time, it's because it isn't an academic exercise. I mean, I totally get where Card Care comes from and I get his frustrations about it. But by the same token, you know, I'd remind us all that we play that the the journalists and the fans and the broadcasters all play a part, a necessary part, in making this a spectacle. So if it means saying fairly intemperate and daft things sometimes, then they will be said. So thank you all for listening to this edition of uh, the 81 All Out podcast. Thanks to our guests, Kartikeya, uh, Daniel and uh, Ashoka. Uh, it was a lovely conversation and we hope to have them in at some point to discuss more aspects of the game and uh, something else, maybe uh, choose a totally different topic. Thank you. Thank you.